So, uh, Father, if you'd like to start with the, with the prayers, please. Blessed is our God, always now and forever, and to the ages of ages. Amen. Thou hast ascended in glory, O Christ God, granting joy to thy disciples by the promise of the Holy Spirit. Through the blessing they were assured that thou art the Son of God, the Redeemer of the world. Amen. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, both now and forever, and unto the ages of ages. Amen. Holy Heirik Felix, Apostle of East Anglia, aid us to advance in the knowledge of the language that thou didst use to preach the heavenly kingdom, and in other tongues that we are currently learning. Pray to our Lord Jesus Christ that he might deign to bless us with the grace of the Holy Spirit who proceeded from the Father, and grant us wisdom and enlightenment to use this precious gift for the sake of our holy Orthodox Church and all men of good will. May the Lord grant us humility not to become proud, but that we might ascribe all glory to the most holy Trinity now and ever, and unto the ages of ages. Amen. Thank you, Father. Well, let me once again introduce our uh, honorable guest. Um, uh, tonight, his name is Father Raphael Armour. He is a rector of St. Ephraim's um, Orthodox Parish in Cambridge, and also an associate cha chaplain at the uh, uh, Institute of Orthodox Christian Studies in Cambridge. Um, he uh, had a career in the uh, marine industry, if I'm not mistaken, in, uh, in England and then in the US. And then uh, with his family, he came back to, to England in 1996 and uh, moved to Cambridge in the year 2000. Uh, Father Raphael was ordained as a deacon for the Russian Orthodox Parish in Cambridge um, in October 2000 and then to the priesthood in uh, July of 2001. Um, and uh, Father Raphael is the last priest uh, who was uh, ordained by a Metropolitan Antony of um, blessed memory. Um, we met in 2013. Back then I was still living in, um, in a city called uh, Leicester and I, I came uh, to Cambridge to visit because my brother lives there. And uh, I, I attended the service in the parish and, and confessed to Father Raphael, and that was our first encounter. And then when I moved to Cambridge uh, later on that year in 2013, um, I began to, uh, with the blessing of Father Raphael, I began to serve um, as an altar, well, help as an altar server um, in that church. And uh, Father Raphael became uh, my uh, spiritual father, and I'm still honored and blessed to, to view him as my spiritual father to this day. Um, so it is wonderful that uh, I, uh, we have a chance to, uh, to talk to him and uh, listen to, to his words of wisdom. And uh, Father, if you'd like to maybe in the beginning tell us a little bit about yourself. I mean, I did do a very short introduction, but I uh, know that a lot of people here in Russia are interested how, um, how foreigners can come to orthodoxy because so many people perceive orthodoxy as this ethnic national religion of Russians or Greeks or Romanians. Um, but we don't do know that it is the apostolic faith. So would you tell us a little bit about how you um, got interested in, in, in orthodoxy and how you saw the light in it and, and, and came to the orthodox Christianity? Don't forget the Russians themselves came to it. <laughs> they that's, were foreign that's right. That's right. Absolutely. Um, I was born in this country. In fact, I was born about 30 kilometers from where I live now. Um, having gone halfway around the world, I end up back where I started. Um, my wife and I had had some interest in orthodoxy before we met, um, particularly my wife. When in, in 1976, we went on an Anglican pilgrimage to a village called Walsingham in Norfolk, about a hundred kilometres or so from Cambridge. And I knew that in that village there was at the old railway station had been um, converted into a Russian Orthodox chapel. I'd seen this in a newspaper and I just wanted to see what it was like. So we it was a horrible wet Saturday afternoon, as only England can produce, and um, we walked up this hill we could see this cupola on this what was clearly a, a great eastern railway station and went in and I can only describe it as for me at that one time walking into the presence of God there was a whole sort of whoosh effect somehow there's any way I can describe it um, it's never happened again I've served liturgy there several times but 
going into that building on that one occasion was was that and that's nothing you can build um much on i think um yes you can refer it to as a as a something that perhaps pushes you or even kick starts your journey um but it was over the next six years that we we i was transferred to new york with my job um the uh, anglican church the episcopal church in the united states was absolutely dreadful at that point for, for various reasons and we found that we lived about five miles from St. Vladimir's Orthodox Seminary. Um, and we used to go there on Saturday evenings for the vigil. And that's when we became much more in contact. And over the next few years, four years, um, we ended up feeling more Orthodox and Anglican. And so we asked to be received into the church. And we were received into the church indeed on Christmas Day, 1982, which doesn't seem very long ago to me, but sounds like something out of ancient history to most of you, judging by your ages. Um, and I worked in New York until, as Philip said, until 1995. Um, I was made redundant. My job finished at that point, and we didn't know what we'd do. We came back to England, and we uh, ran a bed and breakfast, a small hotel sort of thing on the coast very near Walsingham, and we used to go, we, we became then part of members of the parish in Great Walsingham, the Russian Orthodox Parish in Great Walsingham. And it was while we were there doing that that I wondered whether, I don't know why, but something just over a few weeks came to came to what? I don't know. Um, it seemed to me that I maybe was I being called to serve in the church by being ordained. Well, I phoned up my spiritual father in America, and he had told. Well, never mind. He said I should go and see um, Bishop Basil, who was the assistant bishop of the diocese, who lived in Oxford, and I went to see him, and he said, "Well, that's interesting. I was thinking of asking you." Um, and he said there was a need for help in, in Cambridge and would I consider being ordained to serve as a deacon in Cambridge. Um, so that's when he said, well, why don't you write to Metropolitan Antony and ask for an interview? So I did. What I didn't know at that point, but Bishop Basil what must have done, was that Metropolitan Antony not only never answered letters, he never even opened the envelopes when the letters arrived. Um, that he was an old man by then um, and so I wrote that one time and that after six months I heard nothing and I wrote again and I never, and I still heard nothing so here we are a year along that was a very useful thing actually not to have an answer because one day you feel confident about it the next day you don't and over a year or more, things tend to settle and you decide, is this what I want to do or not? And it was. I felt that's what I ought to be doing. And then at the Diocesan Conference in May, about this time in the year 2000, I was walking down a corridor after the liturgy um, and Metropolitan Anthony was walking along on the arm of somebody. And as, he, as I walked past him, he reached out and grabbed my arm. And he was very frail by this time, but he had a vice-like grip. And he said, bring your wife and meet me in the dining hall at four o'clock. We're going to have some tea together. People keep telling me I should be ordaining you to serve as a deacon in Cambridge. I should tell you, by this time, we'd sold our house in Norfolk and we'd just made an offer on a house, this house in Cambridge here. But I had no form of income and nothing to do. So um, when we met him, he said, well, have you sold your house? And I said, yes. And he said, well, um, what about that? Have you got, bought a house in Cambridge? And I said, yes, I just made an offer on one. And all being well, we should move at the end, move to Cambridge at the end of July. Well, that's good. He said, well, when you settle in, let me know and we'll ordain you. And I thought, well, is that it? Apparently it was. And then... Uh, for various reasons, I was I was asked then to be 
become a second priest, be ordained a second priest in Cambridge, in as Philip said, in July 2001. And that was what happened. Mm -hmm. So how, how well did you know Metropolitan Anthony? I'd met him first in in 1975, we'd come across him at a, he was, a, he was speaking at a, a, a conference or meeting of some sort in the village where we lived. Um, we, didn't get, we went along to the, the lunch, around lunchtime and he, we met him. I found it a very unnerving experience because he, he looked at me and it was felt to me as I were looking deep into my soul and it wasn't very comfortable. Um, but then I found out later that's what he did to most people. Um, but then I, I was saying to a colleague of mine years later who knew Metropolitan, Metropolitan Anthony much, much better than I ever did, you know, what do you suppose he saw? And he said, well, you know, most of the, the mess and muck that's in all our lives, but he probably saw actually, hmm, this is someone I'm going to ordain in about 15 years or 20, 25 years time. It's extraordinary, isn't it? If it's true, mm. there we are. Mm. Well, um, may, may, I, may I ask you, am I talking too quickly? What does everyone think? Yeah, it's, uh, good. it's good. Yes, Sushak, I, I think you were trying to say something, but I couldn't hear you <laughs> because your mic is off. Yeah, maybe yeah. I think we just need to um, get used to you know. If you'd, like, if you'd like me to talk more slowly, put your hand up. No, you're all willing to suffer. Good. Okay. <laughs> all right. Okay. Um, so, so it's. Um, I, I think I, I did introduce you, Father, but I didn't really introduce our project. I mean, although you do know about us, and and I told you about us many times. Well, this is the educational center of Saint Felix, of Dunwich, or of Burgundy, and. Uh, uh, it's been around now for, for six years, and uh, what it is about is um, Orthodox lay people, mostly more or less young lay people, teaching languages to anyone who wants to learn new languages for free. And uh, at, at this moment, we have, I think, about seven or eight languages that are being taught, but the main one is, um, is English, and uh, it's, uh, we also teach other disciplines as well, I believe, uh, painting and, and church singing, and mm -hmm. uh, there are many lectures that are organized on economics and other topics, um, all, 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 most of them in, in English. So um, that brings me back to um, our patron saint, Saint Felix, because I think the first time that I heard of him was in Cambridge. Um, uh, I, th I believe you, uh, it was one of those days when he was commemorated and uh, that's, that's when I heard the, the name the first time. But uh, we have a question from one of the uh, participants who is, who is with us now. Um, her name is Anna. Anna, would you, um, should I read your question or, or, or do you, have you got it with you? The one about the, um, uh, the one with the saints. Uh, you can read it. Right. Uh, so uh, let me see. Yeah. Um, uh, so the question stands as follows: An English Orthodox priest from the uh, uh, from Rokor told me just just to make sure who was that priest? Was that Father uh, Andrew Phillips? Father Andrew Phillips. So Anna spoke with Father Andrew Phillips, and he told her that um, uh, in the British Isles uh, there is a considerable lack of interest concerning British saints and generally speaking, the Christian past of Great Britain. So that would include St. Felix. Uh, would you agree with that? And what could be the explanation uh, of, of such phenomenon? Why, uh, if that is the case, why do uh, British Christians, are not, why are they not interested in, in their own Christian past? If you're talking about Christians in general, mm -hmm rather than just Orthodox Christians. Christians in general. Hmm. Well, I think that's quite easily explained by the, the great rift that occurred during the Reformation, when saints no longer, after which the saints no longer mattered to most people. Um, and if you ask most people in this country, 
What do you know about St. Felix? They'd say, who? Um, they'd never have heard of him. Um, I, you, Philip, actually, where you, where you heard it from the first time, Philip, was that whenever I do the blessing at the end of the services, I always include St. Felix and St. Fursey. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The Enlighteners of the East Angles, among the commemorations. Why do I do that? Because... There was one of the basic on Mount Athos about a hundred years ago said orthodoxy will never take root in the British Isles until the Orthodox start venerating the, the English, the, the British saints of before the schism of the first thousand years of Christianity. So I think it's important that we do that. Um, and I think that those who come, those who who come to the the church and, and get a life in the Orthodox Church start to see the importance of local saints, because if it doesn't can't take root here, it can't take root anywhere. You know, it's got to take root wherever it, wherever the wherever the, the Orthodox Church comes. That's where the saints are going to be. Um, and we should rejoice in these saints, I believe. The more we find out about them, the better. Mm. I remember speaking I with... Does that answer your question? Uh, yes, of course. Thank you. I, I remember speaking with Bishop, with the Anglican Bishop, Jonathan Goodall, um, a few years ago, I think maybe about three years ago, when he visited Moscow. I don't know whether you, whether you know him personally. Uh, I, I know I've met him once or twice. Yes. And... Um, and at that time, he told me that it was only the Orthodox in the UK who who who, who would um, talk about the ancient saints, ancient British saints, and uh, make them more popular and more known to people. Uh, so that was that was his feeling. Um, so thank you. Uh, now we have a, another question to you. Um, so this one is 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 quite. Quite interesting. So the Russian Orthodox Church in Great Britain has had different um, uh, waves of immigrants. So the first wave after the, uh, the the Civil War and the Revolution, then there was another wave after the Second World War, then in the, uh, another wave in the 90s, you know, so-called uh, in, in Russian, they're called Novoy Ruski, New Russians. Um, then uh, now there are oligarchs who some of them are escaping uh, from from Russia. Again, I, just to make make it clear, I'm reading the question. Um, so, what uh, what are the what is the key to create a community, a good community with, with that would include all those people? Um, and have you got a different types of Rus Russian Orthodox churches for different groups of people? So maybe from different um, waves of uh, immigration, and how do they? Uh, how do they view the Moscow Patriarchs' uh, governance? So are they uh, uh, happy with with being part of the uh, members of the Moscow Patriarchate or or not? I would. All, all the everything I've absorbed has been from the Russian Church. I wouldn't want to deny a single thing of it. But I think when we get into the West, into this country, you need to know that there are virtually every Orthodox jurisdiction you could possibly find is here. So we have the Ecumenical Patriarchate, which is probably the largest grouping. Without, it is the largest grouping, without doubt. Um, there's the, the Moscow Patriarchate. There's Rokor. There's, which of course was, separate, was still separate administratively. Um, there's the Antioch, the Patriarchate of Antioch. The Romanian Patriarchate is very strong now. That's the, probably the most thriving group in the whole country. Um, and a small Bul Bulgarian group. And I think people come to church not wanting necessarily not necessarily wanting to be still Russian. I mean, I'm not saying the Russians are wanting to deny their Russianness. No, and I think actually they, they, they do feel that it, it is important to belong to a Russian church for them. 
but other people who come to the Orthodox Church from outside aren't looking to become Russian. Mm. Um, and I think it's much better to think that we are um, a parish of the Moscow Patriarchate rather than a parish of the Russian Orthodox Church. If you can, if you could able to, to see that di slight difference, that we happen almost by accident to be a parish under the Patriarchate of Moscow rather than all Russians, because actually most of my parish isn't Russian. I've got R Romanians and Greeks come, um, Bulgarians, um, and of course a, a couple of Germans, uh, people, my wife's American, a lot of British people and people who've come to the church, I've, who I've received into the church over the last I know, 17, 18 years. Mm -hmm. So, and, and, and all those people feel included. Well, I mean, certainly I can speak from my own experience at, at your parish. Well, what I find uh -huh. the nicest thing is that when we get Russian students coming to the university here, uh -huh. and they come to the church and they think it's wonderful, but it's just like being in Moscow and it's in English. Well, if everybody feels at home, I'm happy. <laughs> um, and I, I try to make people feel welcome, you know, to, to make sure when they walk the trouble is a difference in in obviously in orthodoxy often there's a situation with not wanting to you need to give people space if they're coming to the church so they don't necessarily feel that you've got to go over and shake their hand when as soon as you you see them um but you need to they need to know that there will be a friendly welcome for them if they wanted it and i think it's important that we don't just have parish structures that the church is there and you come if you want to and so on but actually what we're trying to do and we should do is trying to build communities centered on the eucharist um that we yeah we all started off in, under metropolitan entity the, when when groups of people wanted to form a an embryo parish if you will they were referred to a eucharistic communities now I see, now we have parishes in Russia and Patriarch Kirill is saying we should now become, try, strive to become Eucharistic communities, make these parishes Eucharistic communities. Um, and I think it's important for, to encourage people to get a life in the church. You know, not just come to church, put your money in the box and take a couple of candles um, once in a while, come to confession and Holy Communion, but build this whole thing into your life. Say your prayers at home. Come to the church every Sunday. Try and strive in your life never to forget God. Light your candles. Come to confession regularly. Come to the Eucharist regularly. And at the moment, we, we can't do that. Mm -hmm. We've got lockdown. You've got lockdown. And we've been locked down for 10 weeks. And suddenly last week, people were getting in touch with me saying, Father, something's got to, I haven't been able to confess or receive the body and blood of Christ for 10 weeks. What can we do? And I've now surreptitiously had people coming round the back of my house into the, into the patio and um, receiving their confessions there and giving them Holy Communion. Mm -hmm. And I think we have to be... It's, it's no good doing nothing. We've got to, we've got, we have to be proactive. The priests have to be proactive, I think. And yes, take risks at times. Hmm. And, you know, going back to the, um, the going back to the original question, um, oh. how one makes people welcomed, you, uh, you find it very important to make new people welcome uh, at, at, at your parish. I, I mean, I remember myself, one of the few, first few times that I, um, started that I began to attend uh, services. I think you uh, you spoke to me yourself, and then you invited me to tea to your house uh, the following week, um, and then we had a nice conversation. And then remember what what was that website? Um, Secret worshipper, anonymous worshipper. Oh yes, there's a there's a, a website called the Ship of Fools, um, and it's a very 
it has quite an amusing, somewhat cynical view of Christian churches in general. But they have in this a, a column every every month, or perhaps more than that, called the Secret Worshipper. And the Secret Worshipper came to St Ephraim's once in, uh, on Forgiveness Sun, the Vespers of Forgiveness Sunday. Gosh, I can't think how long ago now. Maybe I should know, two thousand five, something like that. I should think. Mm -hmm. It's still on the website, I think, about their website, I think. It, it is. So the idea is that they, they attend services at different various churches anonymously and then report on, on, on their experiences um, and then post, post, uh, post those experiences on, on the website. Um, and I think that was a very positive review, as far as I remember, from that gentleman. And that young man actually ended up going to America and becoming Orthodox. Oh, well, you see, that's, that's wonderful. Uh, okay, let's, uh, by the way, those of you who want to ask Father Raphael a question, please do. I mean, that's, that's the point. Um, I, I want Father, Father to, to, to Raphael to get to know you also. So if you want to ask him a question, use that lovely hand um, button. You know, you know how to use it, I believe. Um, so please and then i will i will see that and and you'll be able to ask to ask the question meanwhile let's um let's let's ask another one that i have here in the list um so which what would be the first patristic text you will recommend to a person who just joined the orthodox church and uh in general what literature would you recommend to people uh, that you yourself find spiritually beneficial 40 years ago wasn't it 50 years ago, there was virtually nothing in this country available about orthodoxy in English. Maybe, I should think, perhaps eight or ten books in total. Now there's a lot, a huge amount, particularly published in America. And so we get lots of books available from St. Vladimir's Seminary. Um, new, a whole series of, of St. Vladimir's does of patristic texts, of, I think it must be 50 or 60 books now of, of patristic texts they've put out. There are also books from Holy Trinity Monastery in Jordanville, which is the Rokor Monastery. Um, what would I recommend? Something nice and easy, but something you can keep reading over and over. And that's to me is the 38 sayings of St. Anthony. Mm -hmm. So let me put it in chat. I just think they're absolute gems. You can read these, and none of them's very long. And you've got to let it sink in and, um, and, and, and just mull it over. And, and then when you've read through these 38 saints, start to read them again. But I think that's true of any, any um, thing we're going to read. I mean, the patristic texts are not always easy. I think it's probably also... Um, on the Incarnation by St. Athanasius is, is a good, good book to read quite early on. It's quite simply written. Um, and I think though that we, we need to read good books slowly. Um, don't feel you, you buy a book and you've got to read like, the whole of the Philokalia in one sitting. You know, you, know, you can't do that. You're going mad. So just get something that you can read, maybe and read half a page a day and let it sink in. What about Elder Elder Siloan? What 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 do you think of this? Siloan and Mount Athos. Um, yeah. Yes, people, the, the people are much taken by St. Siloan. It, it, do they know St. Siloan in Russia very well? Uh well, um, well I mean they do know him. Uh do they know him very well? What what do you guys think? Uh, Saint Siloan the Athenite, is he is he very much known in Russia? I think so. Yeah. I think so. Yes. No, I actually learned about him in the UK. So, uh, well, I was then. yeah motivated to read this book before. And then there are of course books by Father Sofroni, who was a disciple of um, Saint Siloan, and who himself has now been uh, glorified by the. Patriarchate of Constantinople. Um, I have to be honest, I don't find Father Sophoni's books very easy to cope with. Um, but that's all right. Mm -hmm. 
Some books speak to you and some don't, I think, and that's you have to accept that. So if you pick up a book and it doesn't mean very much to you, don't worry, leave it and come back 20 years later. It's all right, you may, may have better, better luck with it. Mm -hmm. um, Ivan, I believe you had a, well, there's, there's one, uh, there's a comment in chat. Uh, Ksusha Ksenia Yosefovich wrote that as for the larger Orthodox community in the UK, well, Ksusha, would you like to ask it yourself? Just ask it yourself the question, please. Yeah, so um, I think, as I noticed, there are a lot of different parishes in the UK, but there is no really any communication between them. And um, there are many families, and I think they struggle um, to find a good school for their children to go to. Uh, but um, there is, you know, orthodoxy is a minority in the UK, but maybe if we had better uh, relationship between parishes, then uh, it would be possible to organize some, like, five weeks a day schools, state schools, like with, um, I don't know, like orthodox schools. Is it possible in the nearest future, in your opinion? I think I think that's very problematic because the, ch the parishes in this country, although they, and in this in this town in this city we have the Russian parish, we have a Greek parish, and we have a Romanian parish. Um, we maintain cordial relations still with with our Greek friends, um, despite the difficulties that have been in the last eighteen months. Um, and longer, um, but we're we're small in numbers, you know. So even if you put all the the three parishes together, I doubt there'd be enough children. If everybody wanted to send them to an Orthodox school, there would. I doubt there'd be enough children to run one, or to to, to, to be in one. Um, but also those the parishes draw people from quite a large distance. You know, so there's a, we've got a, par our parishes are here in Cambridge. The next parish, Russian Orthodox parish to us here is in Peterborough, which is about 60 kilometers, 70 kilometers north of here. Actually, I started the services there. And then the next one is to the east is Kings Lynn. That's, a, again, that's about similar 70 kilometers away but there aren't many children there and so people come from quite a, a a large distance to come to the services yes there are people who live in the town and that's that's obviously very good but it would be difficult to organize schools i think thank you thank you could you maybe tell us a little bit about your relationship with the you know with other christians in the uk also because uh, um for instance the church that you're using now the church building that you're using now it's uh, it's an anglican church mm -hmm. right and then before it used to you used to uh, um uh, use the um um westcott chapel which is an anglican anglican chapel um so a lot of people here they don't really know anything about the relationship that our um parishes have with anglicans and catholics uh, abroad so so what what has your relationship been in in the past um, well, Years. I think relations with the Anglicans, with the Church of England, historically have always been very close. They are now, I think, getting more and more distant because of theological changes, um, not on our part. Um, but we have less and less in common. Um, but we have th this church that, which we now have a, a sharing arrangement with, um, St. Clement's Church um, is in, right on one of the main, main roads into Cambridge, so it's quite a, a, a wonderful um, uh, location. It's a rather elderly congregation, but they are very traditional, uh, traditional Anglicans, um, and perhaps they will be conservative as well in their, their outlook on things. And when we went to see them to discuss the possibility of a, a, of sharing their building, I made clear that what we were looking for was a place to be a house of prayer and worship for us, not to be a, 
a concert hall or an art gallery or anything like this. And the older people there who came to this meeting, their eyes lit up because they felt more sympathy with more in line with what I was saying than with their own priest in charge. <laughs> um, but we, we, we have, we've been at this church now for this building for um, a year and a half and it's been very successful. Um, with other churches, yes, I think probably relations with the Roman Catholic churches are better now than they were, they used to be. Um, and, but I think with other churches, no, I, I think they're just getting more and more, we're regarded as somewhat exotic. Um, but we have little in common with them. Mm -hmm. But you do have, I mean, uh, uh, you, you, you do know a few Copts uh, in, in the UK. Many of them come, I think, just to pray. In, yes, uh, some, yes. will, some will come to, to pray with us, yes. Yes, and uh, I don't know whether you know Bishop Angelos. Yes, I do. Yes, who seems to be very, um, very much known now around the world, and uh, not just in the UK, but also in, in the English-speaking mm -hmm. uh, world. So he, Bishop Angelos is the bishop. I think he's now he's Archbishop of Metropolitan. Yeah, Archbishop Metrop of London. Met Archbishop of London. Yes. Um, okay, and um, let's let's go with other questions that I have here. Um, okay. Okay, so um, what are the specifics of services, practices, ordinances of the Russian Orthodox Church in Great Britain? Um, and what kind of, is there anything special that the Russian Orthodox Church in Great Britain, or the Suresh Diocese, the, uh, is there anything special that it could provide to the big Russian Orthodox Church family? So this is the question. Anything in particular? I know that in, Sur in, in, in the cathedral, they do, they have some special um, details about their services. I'm talking about the London Cathedral. So when you say specific of servicing, you mean the services we do each week or? Yes, I presume that is what is meant. Yes. Liturgical cycle. Yeah, liturgical, yeah. Well, we, we follow the liturgical cycle of the Russian Orthodox Church. I must say that some people find it rather odd that we uh, serve on the new calendar. That's a, something I yes. agree with. Um, the previous bishop, Archbishop Yelisei, didn't much like that. Um, he was forever pushing me to change back to the old calendar. And it wouldn't, I would be quite happy to do so. I became more concerned about the, the people, what effect it would have on the parish of people. Because not, again, not everybody is Russian. And people who've come to the church have come to the church as the Orthodox Church, worshiping on the new, serving on the new calendar, um, and the last thing I want to do is to produce a rift in the parish. And I had we raised it once at a parish meeting, and a, a lady phoned me up that evening, a, one of our loveliest ladies, a Russian woman from Lithuania, and she said, "Father, I have grown up using always using the old calendar." She said, "I know we've served you serve on the new calendar." She said there's something special in this parish and we mustn't lose it. So I'm very happy that we stay on the new calendar. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, that's a, a remarkable thing for anybody to say. And I asked our new bishop, Bishop Matthew, last year, two years ago when he became bishop, and um, would he wish us to, to move back to the old calendar? And he said, no, I think for the sake of the parish, you should stay where you are. So I do as I'm told. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, the um, services for the Nativity of the Lord, you would have them on the 25th? Yes, well, everybody serves on the 25th of December, Christmas Day, it's just you just have that, that, That's right, yeah, but... Uh, yeah, but calculation uh, for it. But which we, is... We do on, for Christmas, we do on the, 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 the evenings of the four feast. There's, mm -hmm. four, there's four, the four days of the four feast. We always do Vespers each evening, and at the end of Vespers, we read the... the um, the canon of from Compline. Uh, we don't, we pick and choose a little bit, I suppose. Um, and that seems to work for people. And that's a time when people then can come to that service. And then some of them will come to confession after rather than everybody coming, wanted to come to confession on Christmas Eve. So that's hopeless, you know, on the 24th. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's, 
so we, we do those for you. We do on the, the morning of Christmas Eve, we do the Vesper Liturgy. In the afternoon, we do the Vigil. And then on Christmas morning, we have the Divine Liturgy. And then we have a feast. We hire a hall and we go and ask, spend Christmas Day together. And it's a very popular feature of parish life. We have a feast on St. Ephraim's Day, our parish saint, um, at the end of January. And another feast on Pascha, on the afternoon of Pascha, after Paschal Vespers. And, um, or I have a Maslanitsa as well. Mm -hmm. Sunday. Do you still have the tradition to, to have coffee together after liturgies? We've, re we've re-established it, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, so now we're, we, we, for years we weren't able to have coffee after Wesley House closed. Um, mm -hmm. But now um, we're back, at, we're now we're at St. Clement's, yes, we've, we've, we're having coffee again. Mm -hmm. um, Sonia uh, Ponikarova, uh, I hope I pronounced your last name correctly, uh, wants to ask a question, so Sonia, please. Yeah, thank you. Hello, everyone. Hello, Father Raphael. Hello, Sonia. Um, so my question wasn't that serious, but as concerning that I am a teenager, uh, it's a very interesting thing for me. Especially uh, because in my church, uh, there are lots of teenagers and there are so many Sunday schools, yeah, if it's correctly called. And I'd like to know if there are um, as many teenagers uh, in your parish as it is here. Um, but I mean, uh, obviously, um, if the family is Orthodox, their children uh, would follow them. Of course, it's not always, also as in Russia, uh, but mostly. But if a teenager, for example, doesn't have anyone who can lead them to the church and the society isn't showing them every sign of Orthodox religion everywhere as it is in Russia, for example, uh, how can they follow this route? How can they go and come to your parish, to your church? And so are there really uh, many examples of such teenagers? Thank you. Well, that's right. were, were the teenagers you were talking of, were they of church families or just teenagers in general? Just teenagers in general, yes, not connected with her uh, Orthodox family. Let me say, when I, when I became rector of the parish, when I, was, no, when I was ordained deacon, it was a fairly small parish, only about 40 people. Um, and I think there were two children under the age of 12. Now on a Sunday we are about 110, 120 sometimes, and probably 20% of the, call, the parish are under the age of eight. So we've got a lot of young children, but we haven't got, we had a lot of young people, and not, I'm, my wife and I are the oldest people in the parish. Um, I'm, I'm 74 now, so that's all right. Um, but we haven't got many people in their 40s and 50s. We've got people in their 20s and early 30s so it's all so they've got young children but we've got maybe I don't know only five or six teenagers per se and how do secularized English teenagers find the church I don't know um, I you, I could say, well, if God wants them there, they'll they'll find their way, and that's true. But also, there's a there's a a responsibility, if you like, on us to take the gospel out from the church to other people. Um, how well Orthodox teenagers themselves are good at talking to their peers, the people of their same age, I'm not certain. Um, I never cease, though, to be amazed how God works in people's lives. Um, so I, I'm always open to all sorts of things happening. If you were to ask me how we go about evangelizing secularized British teenagers, I would just hold my hands up in horror and say, I don't know. Or probably what I often think to myself in confession, oh Lord, what do I say now? Um, I don't pretend to know all the answers. I'm just a bog standard peasant priest, basically. Um, 
I tell you a story. We, because of the lockdown here, we're no longer able to have services, and I think that's probably true in Moscow. Are the yes. churches still locked in, closed in Moscow? Yes, until Sunday. Until Sunday. Mm -hmm. Oh well, as far as the British government is concerned, it's only religion, so they're, they're doing nothing at the moment. But the churches may reopen at the beginning of July. Since lockdown, I've been celebrating Vespers on a Saturday and the Divine Liturgy on a Sunday morning and on feast days in our sitting room, about three metres across from where I'm sitting now. It's on a little table with a couple of candles, lamps on and icons, gospel. You know, it's a small table and we set it up with the, with the Antimension and so forth. And I serve it here, and all that people see is just me, my my face, and while I'm celebrating the service. On the week before Palm Sunday, the entry of the Lord into Jerusalem, a young man contacted Cosmin, who is my Zoom specialist, as I call him. Cosmin has organised all this. And said, I'm not Orthodox, but I'm in reading about Orthodoxy and I just want, I've never been to a service. Could I join your liturgy on Zoom next Sunday morning? And Cosmo said, well, of course you can. Here's all, here are all the details. And he told me, and I sent, uh, I sent this young man an email saying, look, it's lovely. Of course, you're very welcome to join us. If you have any questions afterwards, just give me, a, you know, give me an email and we can chat on the telephone or something about that. So, anyway. On Palm Sunday afternoon, he, came, he was apparently at the liturgy, zooming in on the liturgy. And on Sunday afternoon, he sent me an email saying, I have never been to an Orthodox service before. I was at your liturgy this morning and I found it profoundly moving. And I thought, how can you? There's nothing there. You know, we've got no iconostasis. We've got no icons, no candles. You've got no choir apart from my wife and myself. And you see nothing that you would normally associate with church apart from my ugly face. Um, but he found that moving. We, we spoke the next day and ever since we've been meeting on Zoom every Saturday morning and he wants to be baptised. Now... What do you say, apart from glory to God? You know, it's just the way God, if God, and if God can work with a 26 year old, I assume he's about 26 year old man, he can certainly work with teenagers as well. So maybe you must pray for us. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so uh, if anyone else wants to ask a question or should I just read one of the, uh my questions on the list okay so this is <clears throat> this is a question from lucia lucia i believe is is here with us now uh yeah she i think she is so the question is um who uh, we who were th who were those people who inspired you the most or who perhaps are still inspiring you to this day and so that's the first uh, well perhaps you have such people at your parish um and the second question is, which saints do you seem to venerate the most? Um, um, well, let's, let's do the saints first. I suppose St. Alban, the first martyr of Britain. Um, yes, St. Felix and St. First, because there are local saints. St. Ethelreda, who founded the monastery in in Ely, which is about um, thirty kilometres from here, um, Saint Seraphim, Saint Nectarios of Aegina. Mm. Do you know Saint Nectarios of Aegina? Um, so do we? Do we have we heard of him? Yes, we do. Or Saint mm. Nectarios of Pentapolis. Nectarios. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm a great fan of St. Nectarius. Everybody, you, among most Orthodox in, in this country, you come across people, and most of them have got a St. Nectarius story of 
how he's worked in their life. I tell you, when I went up to the, I was, one of our Russian ladies was pregnant and was going to have, was going to, supposed to give birth in January on St. Ephraim's Day, funnily enough, but she developed some, some liver condition and they were going to induce her on the 2nd of January, St. Seraphim's Day. And she was very happy with that. They were going, they decided they would call the boy knew it was they knew it was a boy and they were going to call him seraphim but they did try to induce her it didn't work so they're going to do it again on the next day on the third and they did and it was absolutely horrendous um i don't know anything about the mechanics of these things being a man but i gather it has the, the sort of the, the child is almost sucked out of the womb somehow and anyway she phoned me after she'd had the baby and she said father i'm in terrible shock i, I just can't stop shrieking but can you come up quickly because um, he's going to need a blood transfusion because he's so weak. So I said, well, okay, I'll come up. And I, I left the house and I'd say, I'll, I'll read the prayers with her for the, the, on the first day. So I went up to the hospital, took a taxi up to the hospital with my um, cassock. Where, I was wearing my cassock, took my epitrochial and my... Um, my bottle of St. Nect St. Nectarios oil and I tried to get into the intensive care unit for the, the neonatal critical care unit and I had trouble. I got in eventually. There was no one was going to give me any help or to find where this child was but his, I gl glanced over there I saw Leonid, his father, um, standing by uh, the, uh, the crib. So I went in and I said, well, this is going to be very simple. I said, I'm just going to say the, the uh, Trisagion prayers and I'll anoint him with some, just with, very simple with the oil. And then we'll go to see Anna and I'll read the prayers and then I'll go home. So we anointed the child and we left and we went to see Anna. And who, I mean, I've never seen anyone, but like, she was actually shaking like this. It was I mean, so traumatic. We read the prayers and I sat maybe talking with her for about three minutes. And I got home and it was, this was how long it took. I, I it was, from the time I left the house to the time I got back in, it was 65 minutes. And I know I'd been in the house about 10 minutes when Anna phoned me. She said, Father, I've got to tell you this. As you and Leonid were, were leaving Seraphim, one of the nurses went over Whereas he had been blue, and they, this was a sign he would need a blood transfusion, as, as they stood there, they could see the colour of his face changing from blue to pink. And he doesn't need the blood transfusion anymore. Hmm. I think that's wonderful. You know, thank you, St. St. Nectarios. You know? Glory to God. Mm -hmm. So... I, I witter on too long, I'm sorry. No, 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 and uh, no. Uh, those of us who haven't heard of uh, St. Nectarius or didn't know much about him, well, that's our chance to... He suffered, learn. it was a man, he suffered an awful lot. He was a bishop and he had enemies and he was ended up being deposed and he was put in, then in charge of a seminary which had absolutely <coughs> no money and so on and someone went there and found him on his hands and knees cleaning the lavatories. Uh. Um, and just saying, well, Nectarios, now you've found your true, true vocation. Man of great humility and love. Mm. Mm. And what about people who inspired you in your life? Of course, well, I, still... I, I was very, I was spoiled. I was spoiled. Yes, the people, the, the priest who was in Walsingham, Father David, I knew quite a bit, and he was the end of his life was suffering from uh, from cancer and I we sat in a coffee shop after liturgy one Sunday and I said but father how are you and he said oh I'm dying he said but it's okay he said I've never been so aware of the grace of God as I am now and I thought that was a wonderful thing to be able to say um, we were as I said I was we were received at the church in at St. Vladimir's Seminary, and by Father John Meyendorf, who was one of the well, very prominent theologians, Orthodox theologians of those days. 
um, and Father Alexander Schmemann was the dean. So these were quite famous men, and and then Father Thomas Hopko, and I learned an awful lot from them, really. But the one person I learned most from was a man who was the circulation librarian at the seminary, who spent most Sundays with us. He came from a family. His father would been had worked in steel mills and had helped found three parishes in the time of when St. Tikon was the bishop in North America. Mm. And Stephen would tell us of his family, how they used to go to church. They would walk um, seven, six or seven kilometers to Vespers on a Saturday afternoon, and then six or seven kilometers home again. And on Sunday morning, back to the church, another six or seven kilometers, for, for a matins, um, liturgy, and then everybody would stay for lunch. And then there was a whole education program for the whole parish, then a cup of tea and something, a piece of cake or something, I suppose. And then Vespers, and then everybody would walk home. And that was their Sunday, you know, and that's how, how the parishes, people stayed together as parishes. It really was the Lord's day. Um, but he was a, such a simple man, and he knew he'd known virtually everybody. He knew Father Georges Florovsky. He was a student of Father Georges Florovsky at St. Vladimir's, and he'd been sent by Father Georges to, to meet both Father Alexander Schmemann and Father John Meindorf and their families when they arrived in the, on, the, on the ship from, 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 from Europe to take up their positions at, at the seminary. Um, and but he was such a humble man and you went to his he had no very little money he never had a bank account till he retired and he had to have a bank account for his pension to be paid in um before that he'd been given a paid packet every week i suppose um he was and in his room it was just beautifully ordered there was a his icon table with a, a, gospel, a Greek gospel which he read every day, a, a one volume of the Philokalia and he reads some part of the Philokalia each day um, and, and, and so forth and, and then he would come to us every Sunday and, and really enjoy, enjoy being with a family, it was lovely. So I just learned a lot from him and he stood in the church and was there for every service and I always say to people you want to know what's, how, what the Orthodox Church is about You've got to be at the services. You've got to listen. You've got to, to, to look. You've got to be part of what goes on. Uh, it's interesting how you pointed to the importance of uh, the liturgical texts. And um, that brings back to my memory the fact that at your, at your parish you serve mostly in English, but then some parts um, in, in Church Slavonic. Um, and here in Russia, we have a uh, debate going on that has been going on for a long time now about the Church Slavonic uh, language and whether we should maybe switch to modern Russian rather than using Church Slavonic. And one of the arguments is that people all over the world, Orthodox people all over the world, they have a chance to pray in their own language um, in their common language, and and us Russians here in in, in Russia, we have to use the Church Slavonic. Um, so I don't know whether you have a position on that at all. I mean, I do remember how uh, the first time I, I I heard you pray in Church Slavonic, I was quite uh, surprised how good your accent was. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I told you you were. I, I, I... You're very kind. I, I can only do the short litany. That's all I could do. Well, still, uh, still. Uh, so, so, but still, do you, do, do you think, um, because again, one of the arguments of, of people who, who do like uh, Church Slavonic is that um, we shouldn't be using the same language, the language that we use for regular matters. We shouldn't be using this language to talk to God um, because Church Slavonic is clearly much more poetic and much more beautiful than um, uh, uh, than Russian, modern Russian. Yes, I mean, I, 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 I think the, the canons envisage the, the services being in the language of the people. 
and isn't Dostoevsky beautiful? Isn't Pushkin beautiful? Mm. Um, I, I say that because we use, but we use ourselves some a sort of, I won't say fake language, but actually English, a sort of idea of liturgical English, which is basically 17th century English, of Shakespeare, just about after the time of Shakespeare. Um, but I, I have no problem using modern English. Um, well, liturgically, I, I don't. I can't say my, I can't say my prayers in modern English. I, my private prayers, I still have to. We've we've lost the the second the second person singular. So in in old, in English, in the churches we talk to God as Thou, which is the old German Du, um, and you have the similar thing I imagine in, in the, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so whereas in, in normal everyday English, as you know, we use the word you for being a singular or plural. Well, so we've lost that intimacy in that sense, and I think it's important. Mm -hmm. It's it's quite interesting because the prayer to St. Felix that I read in the beginning of this session, when we composed it, um, we uh, wrote it in, in, in modern English. And then I, uh, I had to use the help of my friend from the States, from Rokor, to make it more, uh, to sound it a bit more traditional than use the vow and all those verbs, uh, the correct uh, forms, so um, so that it would be slightly different from, from modern English, there would be a lot. Um, okay, so um, Luce also had another um, question, so I will, um, I will read it for you in a second. Unless Luce wants to ask it herself, I don't, I don't know. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Father Raphael and uh, Philip. Uh, thank you so much for, for your answers. They are really interesting and useful. And I have um, also um, a question if, well, um, probably you have your favorite um, gospel, your favorite uh, verse of the gospel. And uh, how can I uh, get rid of uh, internet addiction? My per personal uh, question. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you so much in advance. Two questions. Yes. Well, it's, I have to say, is it my favorite? It's the one I always come back to, whether I like it or not. And it's the one where Jesus says, if any man would be my disciple, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow after me. I know I'm not very good at doing it, but I can't get away from it. And every day I have to remind myself, you know, I've got to take up the cross, whatever that, whatever that shape that cross may take, whatever, wherever I've got to take it and follow Christ. And how do you overcome internet addiction? Smash it. Smash. Get rid of the machine <laughs> and you can't because you need it for email because we just we can't get away from these machines um, some people the addiction doesn't just relate to the internet is what they're looking at on the internet and i'm not making any suggestions that you're doing anything improper um, but i think that it, it is a huge tool for good but it's a huge tool for disaster and for for evil, and uh, I think we do need to control things. You know, um, I often wonder what what St John of Kronstadt would make of it. And you know, he was against people reading newspapers. What he would make of the internet, I don't know. <laughs> but, You know, you, 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 we, we do have the choice. We, we always have a choice. We don't, we, if, if we can divide our life up, if you like, in one hour segments, and that's the segment I devote to, I don't know, housework, and that's the segment I devote to reading and study, that's, I do something else. And then uh, there's a, can be a window in there for using the internet. Um, and, but at the, the end of that, time span, an hour or whatever, then you say, okay, that's it. 
Mm-hmm. Thank you so much, Father Rafael. I hope that's helpful. Yes. Good. Oh, thank you. Anybody, anybody else? Does anybody else wants to ask something? Um, Ivan, I, I believe you had a uh, question, Ivan Krilov, if you want to try, ask it. We, for some reason, we cannot hear you. Oh, yeah. Okay, say again. Uh, thank you. Okay. Yeah, Can you fine. hear me? Yes, yes. yes. Okay. Uh, Father, I would like to ask you a question that is important for me personally, because I work as a scientist. And uh, how is it possible to compare it? to combine scientific worldview and the religious worldview, especially uh, especially uh, to combine the, the theory of evolution and, uh, uh, and uh, the creation of uh, human beings. What do you think about it? So just to give a little background, so Ivan, he, Ivan is a, um, a lecturer at the Moscow State University, and then he's got a PhD in, in physics, right? Mm -hmm. This is a question I think that needs to be to go to someone much better educated and cleverer than I am. Um, I personally have never seen a problem in in in, uh, in, in this. Um, I think that we there's a danger of people who regard the early chapters of the book of Genesis as sort of rigid historical fact, which clearly they're not. The, the early chapters of Genesis are poetic and trying to explain to people who are not scientific how we come to be where we are. And on that basis, it's quite nice. It's quite helpful, I think. Then you have, the, now we've become more and more clever and um, want to know how everything fits in with everything else. And it's good to ask all the questions. Um, I don't know how you synthesize, and that's what's needed, a synthesis, synthesize, synthesize the creation accounts in Genesis with something like Darwinism, though whether one would say that Darwinism, or you, you, you said evolution, yes? Yeah. Um, whether they are incompatible, I don't know. What do you think? Mm. I, I think that uh, some dogmas of uh, the orthodoxy contradicts uh, ev the, the evolution, because uh, because uh, God didn't create uh, didn't create uh, death. By death is is a part of evolutionary process. So maybe this is the main contradiction for me. And so I I, I can't combine it in, in my in my mind. And for me it's like uh, a dualism. Science and religious, but. Uh, uh, they don't uh, synthesize. Okay. And does that have an effect on your um, life in the church? Well, I'm assuming you have a life in the church. I'm not. Yeah. Okay. How how do you how does that work within yourself? Mm. But. It, it, it is more uh, it is more theoretical question, but it it, uh, it is not about my life in the church. But uh, I, I think about it and I I try to find answers for for my for my for myself. But I, I can't I can't find it. So... Okay. Um, I'm sure there are uh, many people in Moscow better educated than I and who would probably be able to help you more. I, I might be helpful, I'm sure. Um, well, sorry, I can't. I'm not, not, a, not a subject I think too much about. It's, you know, if I may, I mean, if there's, it's such an interesting topic because people have such different yeah. um, 
diff different points of view. I mean, even in, in this conversation, we, we have um, uh, Vyacheslav, a person called Vyacheslav Metsuk. We can't see him uh, nor hear him. I, I hope he hears us. Uh, he is doing, um, he is doing his um, uh, PhD in, I think, mathematics right now or also physics i i am sorry i always tend to confuse it but uh but he is a strong um opponent he, he opposes the the theory of evolution and he, he believes that it's not compatible with with orthodoxy at all with our dogmatic teaching but then there are you have other people who um would have different points of view i remember i think speaking with father evgeny um and uh father uh, evgeny he also has i believe what a PhD in mathematics and I don't think also physics. Um, um, and he, he also doesn't quite like um, the theory of evolution. Father Evgeny uh, sometimes helps Father Raphael um, in, in Cambridge. I don't know, does he, still, does he still come every now and then or? Not really, no. Not really well, so he used to. He used to help and, and, and go serve with him. Um, so, but then again, you have people who, who don't see any problems uh, in it, uh, even even dogmatically. So, um, so thank you, Ivan, for this. Thank you for for this question. Oh, I'm sorry, I I can't give you a, 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 an answer. Don't give up. Don't give up thinking about it and talking to talking to people about it. Mm. Um, anybody else? Does um, uh, Tanya Kastanova? Maybe you want to. You have uh, some questions, so I, uh, you could sit in the Larina or Bajena or uh, Sveta. Uh, so who would like to go first? Tanya, would you like to go first? Uh, I, I can try, thank you. Please. Um, uh, Father Raphael, you, said, you mentioned this line um, from the Gospel uh, where when Christ, when Christ says, uh, take your cross and follow me. Um, we have to overcome us, ourselves when we're bearing it, um, when we're taking our cross. And uh, this time uh, we have so many changes in our lives. Uh, this period was um, isolation and um, lots of changes are coming and happen uh, with each person uh, in his own life and in life in general. And uh, what do you think? Um, how can we go through this? Uh, what can help us uh, uh, to stand? Um, You're talking particularly about this time with the, the COVID-19. Um, yes, yes. Um, I think this is where we need to see ourselves as part of a community, not just some church, big thing we come to on a Sunday, but something to which I belong and I and the people the other people who belong matter to me. When when the church was closed when the churches were closed, I thought to myself, what do we do? How do I keep this parish together? Um, and I ran it by my starosta and he was very supportive. And I said, I am going to institute evening prayers online every evening at seven o'clock. We'll all come together. If you want to come together, people come together at seven o'clock and we'll have a few prayers together for 15 minutes and that will be it. And it, we're still doing it after 10 weeks. And it was okay, it was okay during Lent because people are used to suffering during Lent. They like sort of suffering during Lent. The trouble is we don't have a sort of discipline of Pascha, which is what we need to have. And so the numbers dropped off after Pascha, which is okay. We're not doing it to entertain people. We're doing it to pray, to keep the parish together. And so at the end of this, um, there's only, all they will see during the, the prayer time is myself and the two readers. And then at the end, Cosmin puts everybody on like this and everyone can sort of wave to each other and, and say hello and, and, and so forth. And it seems to be, have been very much appreciated. It's a small thing, but I think it's, and I think these are things that can hold people together because I know how difficult people have found this time. And it is difficult, you know, you feel separated. It is isolating and it's an isolating in the worst way because 
people can develop all sorts of emotional problems, mental health problems. You know, it's it's really rough. Hmm. I um I think I will uh, ask a question which 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 may sound uh, provocative, but um, the Western world is now uh, focused on what is going on in the states. I'm talking about the riots and the protests and um, um, accusations and, and police brutality. And I know that um, uh, protests uh, took place in England, I believe also yesterday, I think, or before yesterday in London, in support of the uh, um, Black Lives Matter movement. Um, now, doesn't really matter what we think about the uh, the the movement itself uh because it's uh, well, there are many uh, arguments for it and also against it but um do you think that um uh, racism is still a problem in the in the modern world and do you think that the orthodox faith and orthodox christianity can help people uh, fight it uh, because obviously, for us as as, as believers, we, we we know that all all men are uh, were created in the image of God. Therefore, racism just is just not compatible with our faith. Um, so maybe it is us, it is the Christians who can um, offer something to the modern world um, in in this battle against uh, problems that are not so modern but still exist. Um. Yeah, I, I, I think we, I haven't been following too much about what's been happening with these um, demonstrations in London. Um, I rather feel that it's what I would call, what we tend to call a renter mob. Um, you know, people who just like to have a bit of demonstration for the sake of having a demonstration, doesn't matter what we're demonstrating about. Um, it's an absolute tragedy and I think it's, I. I Having lived in the U.S. for 18 years, um, I've never I never experienced anything like this when I lived there. Um, but it's almost as if the, the country is now on the brink of just disintegration, um, and the churches must do something to try to bring peace and harmony, and that's very difficult. Um, Racism is completely wrong. Um, when you set one one nation against another, leaving aside the color of the, the, the question of the color of skin, it don't, those, those those things don't matter. Once you start dividing people up into to groups, social groups, or racial groups, or, or whatever, that's not that's not in conformity with the will of God. I'm sure of that. How do we bring that sense of reconciliation? Goodness knows. Um, it's all part of taking up the cross, I think, as well. Um, and that taking up the cross affects every area of our life. And I've got to, people have to make, each of us has to make a difference where we are, where we are. Hmm. Saint Maria of Paris, Saint Maria Skoptova, who was have you do have you heard of Maria Skoptova? Yes, we have. Yeah. Okay. Um, somewhat, somewhat strange figure, but she in in one of her writings, and I'm paraphrasing, she says, "When I come to stand before Christ on the last day, I'm not going to be asked." Did you say all these prayers every day? Did you so, do so many prostrations every day? And so on. But I will be asked, did you feed the hungry? Did you give drink to the thirsty? Did you clothe the naked? You know, all those things. Did you strive to bring peace and reconciliation, I think, is another one we should add. And as you did not do it to the least of these, my brethren, you did not do it to me. That's quite frightening, actually. But sometimes we do need to be brought up with a jolt. How we go about it, I'm not certain. 
Thank you. Um, anyone else? We have uh, nine minutes left. There's, there's someone on the side here. I'm, did you see who wanted to? I'd like to ask a question to you. Or she's... Yeah, that was that was Sonia, and she's already okay. asked one. Okay. That was the question about teenagers. Um, okay, so um, uh, we have. So who we've got? We've got Ivan Filin, we've got uh, Maria, Ludmila. Uh, Artyom, perhaps you have a question, or maybe Ksenia, or Bajena, so... Uh, okay. Huh? Okay, Artyom? No, not yet, thanks. Not yet, all right, okay. Uh, so, uh, one of the questions that I have for you is obviously, when are you finally planning to uh, come and visit us in Moscow? Because I remember, I remember in 2017, in 2007, uh, no, 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 that was 2016, uh, we were preparing a, uh, a big summit of, 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 of uh, Christian leaders from all over the world. That would be, that was going to be a, uh, the summit in defense of persecuted and support of per persecuted Christians. And uh, you were on the list of participants, but then uh, the summit didn't actually take place in Moscow. It ended up taking place in, 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 the, in the US in 2017. But uh, is it even on your list uh, to, to come here at some point? I think I'm too old to travel. I've got problems with my legs. I'm being stuck on an aeroplane for three or four hours. Doesn't seem very attractive anymore. Mm -hmm. I suppose I could come by train, couldn't I? Some first class railway carriage or something. Right. Well, who knows? You know, maybe, maybe I'll, I'll feel better soon. But... Uh huh. But uh, otherwise, I mean, otherwise we could organize something like this. Yeah. Um, because, you know, what, 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 he, what we do uh, also, because you told us about your online sessions, uh, that you, you have prayers every day and that you have online liturgies. What we tend to do is, for instance, Anna, Anna Grunert here. Anna, can you just. Uh, say a couple of words uh, because because your name is written in Cyrillic and I don't know whether Father uh, can, do, can you read Cyrillic? Yes. Father? Yes. Okay. So Anna Grenet does um, online um, sort of online lessons in French, sort of like a French speaking club um, every week. Um, I organize those Friday um, Bible study um, online lessons, and you're always welcome to uh, to join us. Um, for them, so they, they take place every Friday, uh, five o'clock English time. And then we have other, I believe uh, Katya, uh, Katya Larina is here. I mean, do you do the, uh, uh, well, you do teach Estonian, right? Well, Katya teaches Estonian. Not yet. <laughs> well, you haven't started yet, but um, okay. Yes. Uh, so, well, Ekaterina Larina is going to be our uh, teacher of uh, Estonian language. But uh, so that's what we are trying to do, because so many people say that they feel um, they feel lonely. They uh, they see no uh, no light at the end of the tunnel, so to speak. And um, and it's very important to, to get together, at least online and and, uh, and speak to each other. And I think it was very valuable to have this session with you. Can I ask a can I ask a question? Please. I'm always very interested to find out, with, 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 particularly with Russians. Can you put your hands up if you, those of you who were baptized as children, or had a life in the church from childhood up, or because I just want to see what, what numbers come to the church later in life. And so you were baptized. Our son was baptized in as a child. Anybody else baptized as a child? Okay. And then. One or two people come to the church later in life. Or, mm. so later in life, it's hardly any later, is it? <laughs> um, okay, that's interesting to me. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, Father, thank you so much for agreeing well, to. Um, welcome. I've enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Thank you. It, um, it was it was wonderful. It was spiritually beneficial, and we uh, we learned a lot. And uh, if you ever want to do it again, because we we would be delighted to to, to, to organize yeah. something like that um, in the future, and also potentially we could uh, we could have a uh, an online uh, sort of round table with people from Saint Ephraim if if they want to uh, get yes. to know their brothers and sisters from nice. from 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 Russia. So thank you thank you so much. Um, would you like to um, uh, say the uh, prayers? Before we, uh, before we end, please. It is truly me to bless you, Atheotokos, ever blessed and most pure, and the mother of our God. 
more honourable than the seraphim, incomparably more glorious than the seraphim. Without corruption, you gave birth to God the Word. True Mother of God, we magnify you. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. May Christ, our true God, at the prayers of his most pure Mother, and of all the saints, have mercy on us and save us, since he is good, and he loves all mankind. Amen. Thank you very much, Father. Thank you. And uh, really hope to see you again at some point. Good, I hope so. Nice to see you again, Philip. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, goodbye, everyone. Bye. Thank, Thank you so much. Goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.